Good evening. As most of you probably know, I am an independent member of parliament and I am one of the grand total of two female parliamentarians that represent the people of Gibraltar. This means that in every debate, in every discussion, in every vote put to the representatives of the people of Gibraltar, less than 12% of the vote, opinions and perspectives represent the female collective which is roughly 50% of the population. Some of you might say, well, you're here to represent the entire people of Gibraltar, not a minority or a collective. And you would be right, though not completely. What happens when collectives are underrepresented is that when issues affect them directly are discussed, and most specifically when these issues have a bearing on the privileges of other collectives, this underrepresentation becomes hard, indisputable, and unequal. Just think about who are the main recipients of the privilege in society and have a look at who has historically represented them. In Gibraltar, there's a gross overrepresentation of one demographic white male lawyers, or as I call them, gray men in suits. And it is clear that they get a pretty generous <laughs> helping of the cake, I think, and I think we can all agree on that. These are the dangers of under and over representation. I'm going to give you some information on where we are in terms of political representation of women. According to a study of 2014 from the International IDEA, Stockholm University and the Interparliamentary Union, only 20 countries out of 128 fare worse than Gibraltar on the issue of discrimination by underrepresentation. These jurisdictions are Armenia, Botswana, Brazil, the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Ivory Coast, Djibouti, Ghana, Haiti, Hungary, India, Lebanon, Liberia, Mali, Mauritius, just about by a meager 1.1%. The Republic of Congo, Brazzaville, Samoa, the Solomon Islands, Sri Lanka, Swaziland, and Vanuatu. I think that it sounds pretty crazy, and I'm sure we wouldn't want to compare ourselves with most of these countries in terms of, say, how productive our economy is, or how much corruption, plague, or institutions they bear. However, these stats about inequality of representation seem perfectly acceptable to many Gibraltarians, certainly to most of the ones sitting beside me in Parliament. <laughs> there is a remarkable lack of awareness in Parliament of how much Gibraltar is lagging behind the developed world on this front. And the more I think about it, the more I realize what this is about. Yes. I think we can say this, and we must. We still live in a sexist society. And politicians, as well as the systems they create or acquiesce to, help make this a reality. I'm going to share some anecdotes with you that illustrate this reality. When I stood in 2013 for a by-election, I went around housing estates, knocking on doors. And I came across this one door. I knocked. This lady opened the door. And I told her, I'm standing for election, and I'm your electoral candidate, and I'd like to have your vote. If there's anything you'd like to ask me, please do. And she said to me, well, what I think you should do is go home and take care of your kids and forget all this politics nonsense. And I turned around and I said to her, I have one boy and three girls, and it's very important for me to teach especially my daughters that it is important to provide a public service and to learn to earn a living and be a role model for future generations. That, I think, is taking care of my kids. But, you know, it was really, really shocking that somebody, a woman even, could actually turn around and tell me that. As that campaign continued, as well as other campaigns, a couple of year, years later, I was always told things like, 
you're so brave, but you're a bit crazy um, to leave your children, to pursue a career in politics. You should be home with your children. And these comments, they taught me a lot about how right here in our society, there are still expectations of women that are not in line with what you would think is the 21st century. And these expectations are matched by social paradigms that are all and the all-pervasive gender roles. The truth is that still today, the real-life obligation of a mother of four make it a phenomenal struggle to fulfill any other role in society. For me, a typical workday involves ensuring my four children are dropped off at four different schools, then coming into the office, preparing my work for parliament or seeing constituents, ensuring I am available for a couple of my kids to be around me at lunchtime when they have nowhere to go, um, and then juggling after school activities as from 3.30 when perhaps I might also have meetings or a day in parliament and I never know where I'm going to be and I spend half the day on my phone asking people for favors sometimes to pick them up when I'm stuck and that is how I go every day. My children's father has his job where, where it is expected that he is off limits between nine and six for him to carry out his work. And, and I don't say this with any disrespect to him because he is a great father, but this is the way that it is. The weight on the shoulders of child rearing are on women. And of course, there are, there are exceptions. There are some women who are less flexible and some men who are more flexible, but in the main, these are the expectations that we that we have. <coughs> the weight of child rearing falls on the woman's shoulders. I personally recognize that I'm one of the privileged ones in the sense that I have always had the help and resources when I have needed them. But how about those mothers who don't have them? How, how do they cope? How do they fulfill their, their, their dreams or their expectations of, of running a career? Um, without any help around them. It's, it's extremely difficult. In my field, the levels of inequality are particularly offensive. And considering these existing social norms, it is no wonder that there are such few women in the political front line. I have encountered that this overwhelming majority of men leads to a testosterone-fueled dynamics in which women are spoken to differently often in a patronizing tone that they do not use for other men, often making me question myself and my role when they often say, she doesn't understand, you know? <laughs> so I have often been accused on live debates and interviews of being upset and irrational during debates when something that men never ever say to each other because when they are passionate about an opinion they are deemed strong and leader-like and when women project the same passion they're considered emotional or maybe it's their time of the month <laughs> i have also experienced various forms of subtle verbal sexual harassment for example etama wapakayala i have also been told things in my ear in the workplace like you still arouse me, or walk in front of me so that I can look at your behind. And these are things that should have no place in today's society, and that I just accepted. Recently, I was walking up the street, and I bumped into a man who told me that I was doing great politically, but that I needed to find a man if I needed a leader, you know? Necesita un hombre, tiene que encontrar un hombre, no va a encontrar un hombre para ser un leader. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. It happens all the time. And this is the experience of a woman working among the highest echelons of society, where you would think is the most respected and dignified environment, and where you see the most dignified roles in our society, or you would think. So this is where we have to start the change. We have to start changing things from the very top and hope our examples trickle down to the rest of society. Because this complex matrix that makes up the world we live in, one of the most powerful transformative elements that exists is the action of government. And it is this government, as well as previous ones, that have contributed to a system in which, as per the last available employment figures, of 2,761 people in Gibraltar who had average annual full or part-time earnings of more than 50,000, 
just 551 were female. That is just less than 20%. Inequality is also enshrined in legislation with regards maternal and paternal leave, as Conchita was saying and Hamzin also mentioned. Women are expected to take a meager 14 weeks of statutory maternity leave, a figure which puts us on a par with Benin, Burkina Faso and Cameroon, for example, with the disadvantage that these countries grant at least two weeks of paid paternity, like you just said. Leave leave for our zero and light years away from the 58 weeks of Croatia, the 62 weeks of Estonia, or the 68 weeks of Sweden. Of course, these countries have measures such as paternity leave and generous periods of transferable paternity leave in order to sh help share the burden of parenthood fairly. Have you asked yourself why this is the case? I'm pretty confident that nobody in this room considers women less driven, capable, or willing to take on these challenges. Is our society then more backwards than other Western democracies? Is it that this society wants to continue with antiquated gender roles where the woman is happy to be the homemaker while the husband goes out to work? Or is it that the woman wants to be more immersed in an equal society, but finds that both the law and the dynamics of the, of the workplace do not allow her to. From a legislator's point of view, and this is a personal ambition of mine, we have to convince all our politicians that allowing the burdens of childbirth and caregiving be carried disproportionately by 50% of its members is a terrible as well as inequitable idea. This is not a left versus right issue. It should not be a party political bone of contention. As Shinzo Abe, the Prime Minister of Japan, a liberal democrat and not particularly left wing put it, women are the world's most underused resource. We, the women, are the ones who have to give up promotions and career plans and settle for less ambitious commitments. We have to forget about a career in politics because its fast, demanding pace clashes with our role as primary caregivers and other work commitments. We are pushed out of the circles of power by a language and an etiquette that is brash and aggressive that forces us to take on a confrontational and equally brash veneer if we are to be taken seriously. Much has been written recently about the need to feminize politics. Even though I disagree with this kind of gender pigeonholing, I do believe that Gibraltar would benefit from more sensitive, constructive, consensus-based policy making. Qualities usually attributed to women, both in life and in politics. It is obviously not by lack of desirability that women take on a secondary role in politics and the professional arena. It is clearly a case of an antiquated discriminatory system that even though we have had some improvements on, continues to place a glass ceiling above the heads of Gibraltarian women. We need this changed urgently because we need the smart, talented and sensitive women of this community to take their rightful place and help us create a better and fairer Gibraltar. It means recognizing that we still have a huge debt to repay to our women. That means <coughs> that we need fairer employment laws, the introduction of quotas in areas of public service and greater protection against harassment and abuse. Finally, I would like to remind you that after government, the second most transformative element in society is the other voice of the people, the voice of those who decide to fight their own corner with freedom and courage, unbound by tradition, diplomacy or protocol. I'm talking about you, about us and about civil society, about those who campaign tirelessly for the underprivileged, for the underrepresented, for the voiceless underdogs of our society. So thank you so much for being here tonight and thank you for caring about your community. And I hope that all of this will bear fruit sooner than we think. Thank you. <laughs>